Thank you very much for asking me to come talk today. And I'm not supposed to say I'm not a packaging person, but I'm not. So everything you're doing is interesting and new to me, too. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit broader about what's going on at the Food and Drug Administration for predictive toxicology, our roadmap and our implementation, and how CIFSAN is playing a key role in what that impl implementation plan will be. So, okay, so why did we develop a roadmap? Of course, I call like last year the year of the roadmap because everyone seemed to develop one and FDA tried really hard to get ours out first, which we did. But we felt that there were so many advances going on in the field of predictive toxicology that we really needed to all work together as one agency to um, bring some of these new advances and new tox tools into the marketplace for our products. And also we thought it was critical to look at um, uh, reducing, replacing, refining animal testing. So, whoops, that went too far. How do I go back? Yeah. Use the back arrow. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So the we have a, a senior toxicology working group, which is uh, the senior toxicologist one or two. So from our center, it's Tony, Mattia, and I, uh, from all of our six product centers, and our uh, field. Field Force, the Commissioner's Office, and NCTR. So we, we form this um, group so that we can all talk together about things that are going on in the centers. And so the Commissioner uh, came and asked us to develop a roadmap. So even though every product center may have different uh, legal authorities, we felt that by working together as one agency, we could really um, accomplish something. So let's see if I can get this light-handed on it. So one of the things we wanted the roadmap to do was to en emphasize what we call qualification and context of use. So qualification is a, is a word that we use instead of validation. It's a conclusion uh, that based on the results of the assessment, you can use the model to, to be relied on to have a specific interpretation or application in product development. And context of use clearly defines what that tool can do and what it can't do, and its limitations. So actually developing a context of use for a tool is probably one of the hardest things, but this is how we are moving forward as an agency with this program. Uh, we do have two formal qualification programs, one at CEDAR and one at CDRH. People seem to think that their new tools need to go through these formal programs in order to be used, but if you wanted to use it in an application, any experienced toxicologist can tell you what data they would need to qualify, but if you want to share your tool with the world, he would want to put it through a qualification program for others to use. And so we, on, we wanted to emphasize partnerships, partnerships with all of you in industry, government regulators. We felt that the way that you ensure new technologies advance and are getting integrated into regulatory risk assessment w would be in partnerships. And we, but we feel very clearly that regulators had to be included up front in all method development. That it's, you know, we've seen other instances where agencies or other people have developed new tools without talking to the regulators and they're trying to fit them into a regulatory program. So we feel very strongly that for regulatory risk assessment, we, we need to identify the gaps. We know what the gaps are and we know what um, tools we might need. And we also wanted to make sure that new tools then are trained so that our investigators, our, our reviewers, regulators don't see new tools in an application for the first time. And I kind of liken that to when we came in the other day and found we were now with Microsoft 16 instead of 10. And we go, oh my God, I can't do anything. What am I supposed to do? So I think we want to save that kind of thing so that everyone is familiar with new tools and are trained on them before they see them in an application. So this is the predictive toxicology roadmap. We announced this, uh, the uh, FDA chief scientist announced this at the very end of December. And, and I'll just go through quickly what it talks about. It talked about the senior toxicology work, oh, this has got some sound on it. Toxicology work group, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, training of researchers, continued communication. Uh, oh. Okay, stakeholders. Okay, okay, so I can go through it quickly. We training, I, I guess I must have used a couple of the slides that had been, had um, animate content, okay. So it talks about the toxic, the, we act as an agency, so we uh, communicate with each other through the toxicology working group. So if I have something that's going on with Tox 21, I send it up through there so they can send it out to all of the toxicologists in the agency, and hopefully that's working because I'm sure you heard yesterday that communication in any organization is the hardest thing. 
We wanted to train our, our stakeholders. We wanted to have collaborations with our stakeholders, so training our regulatory reviewers, partnering with our stakeholders to, um, to foster collaborations, leveraging our research to make sure our research programs, we don't do basic uh, discovery research at FDA. We do directed research, in, and hopefully that's what we're all doing to answer a regulatory question. So at CIFSAN, if you want to do a research project at our, our labs or at NCTR, we, um, we have, they have to demonstrate what is the regulatory gap and how is this going to answer it. And then the last and I think most important thing is that we have, we have to report back to the Office of the Commissioner, and you'll see that we're about to do it. So oversight, a lot of the, um, a lot of the plans that come out don't really have any oversight, but when you have oversight by your commissioner, and they're tracking the progress and figuring out how we can make it transparent to all our stakeholders, then um, we can do that. So then we have the roadmap goals. I just explained this is a critical activity. We want to implement the roadmap, and we want to engage our stakeholders um, so that we can fulfill our mission. So that's really the purpose of it. We work together with our stakeholders to develop new predictive tools that we can use in regulatory risk assessment. And I think this, this partnership that we had with FDA, NIH, and DARPA was really an example to us about where you put, if you put regulators first um, in helping to develop a new tool. So when DARPA came to FDA in 2012 with a picture of a box and a funnel and an arrow going out of that and wanted to develop organs on a chip, even though it sounded a little wild to us at the time, we entered into it. So when we first put out the, with DARPA, put out the um, announcements for the grant, and someone came in and said, you know, I want to develop a liver chip, or I want to do this, or I want to do that, then we had our, especially our pharma people right there, the regulators saying, okay, these are the, these are the endpoints that we think you might be interested in, these are the reference compounds you might want to use, and then we met with them continually through the program, and I think in five years we created a program that was really pretty exciting. Um, and I think basically, um, it all be, and, and one that a lot of people at FDA already knew about. I think you heard yesterday about the new toxicology strategic and operation plan. This is their roadmap that came out, came out right before SOT last year. And um, the CIFSAN is the lead for uh, Tox 21 for FDA. And so we were, we, this is the new goals, and we were, we were pretty strong when we just did the last MOU that we wanted it to encompass more than high throughput screening, which the, the last operational plan did. We wanted it to also have um, zebrafish, C. elegans, in silico modeling, some of the other things that you see in there, organs on a chip, and other types of new alternatives, and not just focus solely on the um, high throughput screening. Um, and, and so the new plan does talk about that. Um, in a little bit more detail, although a lot of it is, is done here. So, and then, of course, we were all part of the ICFAM plan. Uh, ICFAM is the Interagency Coordinating Committee on the Validation of Alternative Methods. So again, CIFSAN is the lead for ICFAM. Jeff is on that committee, too. And, um, and again, this roadmap said that regulators should come first in that. I think they saw that in the past they developed methods that neither FDA or EPA thought were really applicable to our regulatory programs, and now they've decided that the regulars have to come first and that they need to work with, if they want it in regulatory risk assessment, they have to be part of that. Um, so I think, and then there's also the, I don't have a little slide for it, but Osco Tosca came out with their roadmap too. So you have four roadmaps that are kind of traveling along together, and all of them, I stole this slide from ICFAM, but um, it all developed the three C's, which are communication, collaboration, and commitment. So I think you saw that in um, the FDA's roadmap. We want to communicate with all of our toxicologists at the agency. We want to communicate with our stakeholders because we all are interested in the same thing, bringing safe and effective products to the marketplace. And we want to collaborate with you, and we want to make sure everyone knows that FDA, for our roadmap, we are committed to moving predictive toxicology forward in partnership with our um, stakeholders. So we did have a public hearing on our predictive roadmap last um, September, I think, and we asked um, people what they thought. We made, people came in and made some presentations on their models, 
and they gave us a series of questions. And I think um, in summing up what we heard, we heard that FDA needed to be transparent, that we needed to um, communicate what we were doing um, in alternatives. We had to uh, have one place to come in and talk to FDA, and we're, so we're listening to all those comments, and you'll see a little bit later what we're doing about them. Um, in a, in a, but, so it was a good thing because we heard, heard a lot about what people did, include, including models uh, that they're, they're bringing up. And having read all the transcripts, it was pretty interesting, and, uh, and uh, talking to the commissioner's office. So then each center was asked to look at their uh, roadmap responsive activities, and that's what we're doing at CIFSAN. And we had two goals, to look at, update our current tools in our toolbox, to reevaluate those tools, and then to evaluate new tools for regulatory risk assessment. And I have three new tools. You also heard about our, our expanded decision tree um, yesterday, and some in silico work, and I can just, I, so I'm not gonna cover them here, although those are new tools that we're doing at CIFSAN. But I, I did want to mention that when we were at SOT, we have this FDA meets EU tox risk, and for people that, so this is the third year we've done it. So EU tox risk is a public-private partnership on the Horizon 2020 in Europe, looking at alternatives. And the two areas that they were very interested in partnering with us on were organs on a chip, because that's one of their endpoints, but also this expanded decision tree and TTC. So we haven't, we're, we haven't set up that partnership yet, but it was really exciting to see that uh, we could expand um, our um, work with, the, with the, some of the, what's going on in Europe. So what are we doing under these things? Well, first of all, we, if you saw our SOT poster, we evaluated the dog for food and color additive safety assessments. Did we really need the dog? Or did the dog really add to the assessment of direct food additives or direct color additives? So what, what we did was we pulled out 162 we, like, I mean, we had a team of people doing it, um, under uh, 162 food and additive petitions to look, that had one or more dog studies and looked at, you know, from 1950 to 2018, everything we could find in our database. And found, first of all, very few dog studies are being done. And second, there was no real unique toxicity for food or color additives that you needed the dog for. And we concluded that um, and that very few people are putting dog studies anyway, and that, that, that maybe rodent studies combined with some ADME data could be sufficient to evaluate the safety of this. So we're going back now. We divided them into decisive studies, supplemental, or, you know, I can't remember, decisive, collaborative, supplemental. So we have three categories. So the one, bottom one, the dog really didn't add to it, but we didn't really want to say it was not worthwhile. So. Um, but we're going to go back and look at the decisive because there were a couple examples where maybe an a ADI was set on a dog study and going back now as we write the paper and say, well, if we didn't have the dog and we used the rodent study, comparing that to the estimated exposure would have really made a difference. So, um, so that's something that's coming up that's, um, that's really good. Uh, that's, I think, will really move the science forward that maybe we'll come into, um, and, and I think we looked at this study and said, no, we don't want to use dogs because they're really cute and we don't like using dogs. We wanted to use science. We wanted to use the science, a science-based approach to say, do we really need the dog study or not? Um, so, um, so I think this, that was a really good study and we're still working on our paper on that. And we also had a symposium about, uh, I guess maybe three weeks ago, on the rodent bioassay, designing the bioassay for the 21st century. And we had these presentations are all available on the SOT website. We had about over four, we had, this was a really hard to do. I was in charge of this one because first we thought we might be furloughed. So the last week we were trying to, what are we gonna do with furloughed? And then, then we didn't get furloughed, but the day that, that we had the meeting, it snowed and they closed our building. So we had to do it all by webinar, probably, in, but we still had over 400 people from 17 countries on this. Um, I'm sure there, some of the talks were a little controversial, maybe Sam Cohen saying we could get rid of the bioassay. But I think it's worth talking about because there's so many different people looking at the bioassay and we really, you know, we have, um, I guess, a lot, we have Doug Wolf and, you know, Sam Cohen and writing papers and we have, we have EPA having PETA write 
exclusions from the bioassay, and we have what's going on with ICH. And I talked a little bit to SOT about trying to consolidate all of this into one group. So, and, and we have uh, Nicetum and ICVAM saying we can use the, you know, 10 characteristics of a carcinogen, just use high throughput screening. And so I think while we're not ready for that, we don't, you know, we want it, everyone talking together as one group. Um, the regulators, you know, saying what, what are the questions that we want to answer? What is the bioassay answer? And, and, and also to say that we're not saying that there was anything wrong with animal data. The, the, the data that we got from the animal studies were good, but recently we had to take flavors off the market because, uh, because of uh, data and high-dose testing in animal studies where, and I see if I can remember this right, but Jeff can, that for ethyl acrylate, one of the ones that were, were taken off the market, the lowest dose in the study where it showed nothing was still a million times higher than the, than the estimated dose of that. So we can see it's not an effective tool anymore for us because we're not, uh, with a high dose testing, because we're not allowed to use science. We're a science organization. We're not allowed to use science in order to make our decisions. And that's frustrating for all of us there um, to, to be put in that position. So just looking at the bioassay and trying to get reasonable dosing would be a good step forward. <laughs> In addition to doing what, what we're looking at with, with um, bio, uh, bio, uh, biomarkers, surrogate endpoints, things that our pharmaceutical people are doing and, that they, and they can, we can partner with them to see what, how they're doing. So that's one thing. So we looked at new tools. You heard about our two other tools. One thing that we developed was the C. elegance, the nematode model for developmental neurotoxicity assessment of mixtures. So for, for me, one of the things that I work on is metals. Or we have a toxic elements program that we started at FD at SIFSAN, and toxic elements is what we call metals. So metals and food, and with a specific focus on uh, child, infant and children's food, because we've measured me a lot of metals in those products. And but we don't. But the way SIFSAN looks at things right now, we look at one commodity, one chemical, one commodity at a time, and we realize that's probably. We need to look at mixtures, and mixtures is a big area right now in toxicity anyway. And we knew that all of the metals were uh, developmental neurotoxins. And so it, it causes some concern, and we wanted to get some idea of, of what we could, what, how we could use, um, you know, what data we can get, okay, without doing especially rodent studies. We do have a rodent study on arsenic going on right now, developmental neural study on arsenic. But so we knew, or I knew that the, that a lot of the pathways that arsenic affects are conserved down to the nematode, and we thought it would be a good model to look at it. And we did a, we've done a mixture assessment on, um, she's developed in its arsenic, lead, and mercury to look at it, and we, and we found developmental delays and, and um, hyperactivity in worms that are tested. And you have to kind of see all the data, because we, we did all the metal, we did some of the metals alone, and then we did them in different mixtures. So, um, so this was this was exciting because it got it gave us some of the same data we are seeing from our our developmental neuro study in uh, rodents, uh, pups, and also what we saw in some of the epi studies where arsenic was a concern. So this is a new model that we're developing. We're we're working with um, uh, the ICVAM to have a uh, qualification study done to see how it acts for other types of chemicals. So that that's exciting, and. We're doing a uh, reach a, read across is a, another new tool that could be used, and so we're developing a um, the underwriters lab is, has developed a chemoinformatics toolkit which included risk a reach across excuse me a reach across program. So we're going to identify 30 chemicals related to cosmetic ingredients, food contaminants, food contact substances, and we're going to run them through this tool to see how uh, what kind of data um, we get compared to known animal data. The endpoints that this tool looks at now are mostly um, acute endpoints, something that we don't look at that much at FDA but may have some data. And they're also trying to develop a DART component. And for that DART component, we're going to identify some compound and see how that works. Okay. So we hope that just looking at this tool will give us, and the other chemoinformatics toolkit, we, we haven't signed this yet. So we're hoping that this will give us some information about one particular reach across program. And there are a lot of reach across programs right now because we feel this might be a good tool 
to use in regulatory risk assessment, and then to share what we find with the FDA toxicology work group, because some other centers, especially devices, are also working on um, Rita crops. Uh, actually, CIFSAN, um, I mean, FDA nominated Rita Cross as an ICFAM working group, too, so we're involved in it from that point of view, as well as a DART working group that we chair. Okay, this is my favorite subject. These are organs on a chip because I helped design this program and we still are working very much on it. Uh, one of the things we're going to do, and this was presented by someone else, I took the slide, is, is to look at definitions. Now you see here one definition I guess I wrote in a paper and one Dr. Marx from Germany wrote. We, we feel the one thing is that the terminology, there's no agreement even on the terminology for microphysiological systems and, and that's one of the things that we want to look at. Um, you, you know, is it just any 3D? Is it a microfluidics? Is it what? What do you what do you mean by MPS? In fact, I saw a paper from England, and they have another term like organs on a chip. O, O A C the O O A C. So it just that's another acronym for it instead of MPS. So that's one thing that's really needed for us. Um, FDA is doing a lot of internal research. This is a really important program for FDA as part of our implementation plan for, um, I mean, just, just saying we've put together an agency in vitro safety working group. So it, it's, we're putting it together with people from all of the different program centers, our, our commissioner's office, our field force, and NCTR to all work together. And the focus of it, which was the commissioner's focus, or by tomorrow they former commissioner would be um, would be uh, microphysiological system. So we have several of them going on at FDA. We have our chip, which we'll talk about later, the emulate chip. We have the MIT chip at CEDAR. We have the German chip at NCTR. And we have um, CBER and CDRH developing their own chips. And we're all talking together in a user group. So if you remember the microphysiological system program was a five-year program to, uh, um, to develop the engineering part of it, which was the MIT and Harvard, and then to develop specific organ chips that were supposed to fit into either the um, organ, e either into the MIT or the uh, uh, DARP, uh, Harvard platform as sort of a plug and play type thing. That didn't really come about as much as it did. Now there's a lot of different platforms. But DARPA really envisioned it first, and I think it was good to have only a couple platforms, and then every chip could work into that. And FDA provided, as we said, a lot of help. OK, those were the current goals. And now if you just look at a chip, you see how complicated it is. These are all the things that are part of a chip. Going back, you can see. And in looking at performance criteria, um, one of the things that I've thought about is to have criteria or questions that you ask about each of these different parts of a chip, you know, uh, and then putting it all together. But that's something we're still talking about. Um, this is what uh, NCAS is doing now. They are looking at just getting all their things that they're doing. They're looking, they're developing disease models on a chip. That's one thing that they put out. And they also have chips in space. So they're working with NASA to bring chips in space on the Space Center, and they went down and saw a launch of the Space Center, and, uh, and, um, and then they set up some chips testing centers in academic areas. Oh, what did we do? So we, we, after the real program came over, we signed a CRADA with Emulate, which is the spin-off company with the V's, to, um, to bring that into our lab, the liver on a chip, for the first time. But we didn't do, we did this, this blog that I did, and, and we had a cooperative agreement, but we didn't do much of a rollout. And so we were surprised that, that we got, first of all, we got a, a letter from PETA with like, I don't know, 60-some thousand signatures, a good letter from PETA, which doesn't always happen. Uh, uh, telling us this is really great and, and, and you know, we got, we got a lot of praise for that. And so the goals of, and, and we also got some money, we went back and asked DARPA for some money for us and also for the MIT chip, which is in, which is in Cedar. So we're looking at the liver on a chip, we're beta testing the emulate system, which is over. We're looking at it for some concordance data and then we're going to um, develop performance, we're starting to develop some performance ch chip standards. We can't. We can't go out and endorse a proprietary technology like Emulate or, any, or MIT or any other things. So FDA doesn't endorse proprietary technology. So what you do instead is you develop 
performance criteria, and if you look at OICD, they call them performance standards, but we're using the word criteria to get away from the standard stuff that you have to go through in bureaucracy, you know. So performance criteria that if a chip or any in vitro method meets, then that means it's essentially qualified for whatever it is. So we're looking at that, and um, this just goes through what we're doing to face uh, personnel. We're using it to, we were gonna try to look at um, known food, we're looking at, we have the liver chip, we have two, the two cell liver chip with um, the hepatocytes and the endothelial cells. We're talking about, to emulate about getting the four, two more cells in the liver, and also to get the gut on a chip, and, and we might, and the gut on a chip might go also to our CVM people, so that's what we're doing next. When you, when DARPA really put out its, its um, an initial um, call for data, you know, proposals. One of the things that you had to do was you had to have a commercialization plan. So both MIT and Harvard had to have a commercialization plan to make these chips um, more commercial because they didn't want uh, groups being paid for by government money and then not being able to use the chips. So, um, so what's coming? So this is what we're this is what we're doing. Uh, what's coming at FDA? We're doing, it, as I said, an implementation plan for the predictive toxicology roadmap, which means that I said we're putting together a in vitro working group on um, new, new tests with all the centers, and we're trying to put that together now and get all the center representatives. Part of it will be having, uh, giving people the opportunity to bring in, have a webinar on the news technology, but if you're gonna come in, you have to because we're getting, we get inundated, I get inundated all the time, I've developed this, can we come into FDA and talk about it? So we want one place where people come, but they also have to say, okay, <clears throat> what regulatory gap or question do you think your technique can answer for us before you come in and tell us about it? Because, you know, we, we don't have time to read all the literature, we're not test developers here, but we want to know what, what you think this chip can do for us for a regulatory example, and then we'll look at it, and then if anyone in our center is, our agency is interested in working further with that person, we'll, we'll make it easier for that center to develop a CRADA or tech transfer or some other agreement to bring that technology into their lab. But we won't, we're not gonna, um, say we're gonna put it through a qualification program, but we'll make it easy for you and we'll listen to it. So we also have a workshop tentatively scheduled for the 18th of September where FDA will present to, to the, our stakeholders what, what we're all doing on alternatives for predictive toxicology as part of our commitment to be, to report back to the commission and to be transparent, okay. This isn't where we're gonna be asking people to give us their comments, but it'll be really us and the chief scientists talking about what we're doing. And then of course we have this FDA SOT colloquium series that was really the brainchild of Des Dennis Keefe, but it's expanded more. We have a, one on bioprinting April 9th um, in the morning, which should be interesting to do. And next, next year we have a lineup of, um, I have one on uh, IATAs as the future integrated testing strategies as the future of predictive toxicology. We have something on dermal inhalation. Jeff, do you remember you're on the rest of it? And something else. So we have an exciting program for the rest of this year. I think we have bioprinting and then IVIVE, and then next year some more alternatives there. So with that, that gave you an overview of what's going on at FDA. We're excited about this program. We're excited about our stakeholders working with us, and uh, I can take any questions. Not packaging questions. Thank <laughs> you.